Okay, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, I wish those of you watching at home could see how full the classroom is. I guess I'm the only class tonight. Oh, there's only two. So you're, some of you are stuck here. You're not here by choice. My apologies. Uh, I hope you can get through it. I hope you can get through it, but I'll try to make it as helpful and interesting and exciting and edifying as possible and, of course, God-honoring as we can. But welcome to you, those who are watching, wherever, whenever you are, and a warm welcome to everyone in the room. And if you're not in the class regularly, I usually have something a little fun to start with, an image or a current event or something like that, or show and tell. You know, during the, with all, when I had all the red, white, and blue stuff here, I forgot to show my little magic wand that somebody did, Rose, did you bring this? Or no, somebody brought this to the, to the fellowship on the 4th. I thought so, right? Yeah, it's, it's so happy it lights really, up like Jenny that. Brought it, Jenny. Okay, well, if you're not patriotic enough, I will christen you, see, and this, like, it's like a magic wand that <laughs> turns you red, white, and blue. But my, so I guess that's the show and tell. But really, it's the walls. So since I wasn't preaching Sunday, I power washed a few more tables, so some of you are lucky sitting at the cleanest table. The, the cleanest one in here, no one is sitting at o over there uh, to Barry's left and behind, behind him over there. Uh, but remember the walls were all marked up and such and the color of the back wall. I just didn't have time to finish and do the back wall. It's a, man it's a monumental ordeal for me, in fact, in the middle of it, I had, I've actually stopped and put some of the chairs together and took a nap uh, uh, because I just I get worn out trying to do it. But I finally, fi we finally, it, we did this in 2019, so it only took three years to paint the other two walls. And so in three years, when we're in Acts chapter 16 or whatever, then I'll try to do the back wall, Lord willing. So. But what I, what I wanted you to notice that make, little things make me so happy, but these little touches really thrill me about the room now. But see, even the switches are gray, see? And the, plug, the plugs and the plug plates, they're not that hideous beige, that, uh, that, that the standard color that you get. Um, so yeah, now, now they all, all the plugs and plug plates and light switches on the gray walls are all gray as well. So it looks like a big prison cell, I guess, now in here. So it's all gray. So I, I really, though, honestly, I've left this stuff up here until I can get some Bible verses, some banners, and maybe some, some appropriate uh, posters, maybe artwork um, approved uh, by everyone that I can use to make the, you know, as an ornamental feature of the room, because I do think it facilitates the learning experience to have a, as pleasant uh, an environment, aesthetically pleasing environment as, as possible. So I know those are things, things are little and maybe a lot of people don't even notice some, but maybe subconsciously, see, it makes, makes it a better experience. Or maybe, maybe I'm just making stuff up, so I don't know, well, let's see. All right, so here we are, Paul's speech in Antioch of Pisidia, in the Pisidian Antioch. This is a tremendously important speech because it's the first lengthy sermon recorded by the great, that Luke records of the great apostle Paul. And so it is typical of, there's some seats at the table over there if you want. It's the cleanest table in the house, by the way. It's been power washed just for you. Or you can sit there. Uh, well, what were we talking about? Paul, yeah, it's typical. It's representative of the kind of preaching Paul would do in the synagogue to Jews and God-fearers who believed in the God of Israel and had attached themselves to the Jewish community. So as we worked our way through this, and we, we made this point um, about how it's representative of Paul's preaching, but let me get here. This is where we left off in this tremendously important statement that he makes here. It's the theological significance of this is, is very important because the Jews might have thought, 
you remember we said the misconception is that our Messiah, what God has promised, is to send us the Messiah to be a political ruler for us to be restored to the glorious kingdom such as it was, for example, in the period of Solomon and drive out the Romans. And so, that, so they were thinking of an earthly deliverance and a, of a political type of salvation. And he shows that this salvation consists in forgiveness of sins that you can now have through Jesus. But now he's talking to his Jewish brothers and sisters who might think, well, we have the law. We have the Torah. We have the sacrificial system in Jerusalem, the temple, and the high priest on the Day of Atonement. He makes atonement with the animals, with the blood of the sacrifice, and our sins are covered. Paul has to emphasize to them that we need atonement through the blood of Christ because the law cannot, he said. Through Christ, you can now be justified. The word freed, freed is actually the word justify. Again, I know some of you weren't in here last week, so I'm just pointing that out again. It's the, it's the word justified, big theological term about our salvation, being put right with God, declared just, even though we've sinned. Paul in Romans shows how God can be a just and holy God and declare sinners to be justified or righteous. He can do that because of Christ. Hold, hold all my calls, Les. So, so he says, in Jesus, everyone who believes is justified from everything that you could not, that you could not be freed or that you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So it's not just that um, Christ is another way to be justified. He's the only way. And keeping the law cannot uh, bring justification because uh, in order to be justified through keeping the, of the law, Paul points out in Galatians, you'd have to keep it perfectly. When you break it, the times you're keeping it doesn't make up for the times that you break it. Uh, the blood of the animal sacrifices are, are, were only foretelling the ultimate sacrifice of Christ as God and man, the only one in a position to be able to reconcile us to God and bear our sins. And so we looked at these tremendously important passages later in Paul that you'll see. This is Paul preaching here. And you see him later talking about this in his letters. But what, what the application we made as class was ending is, a lot of people fail to understand their need for Christ today as well because of the kind of, uh, I guess we'd call it moralism, where people feel as long as you're a good person and you're generally keeping a lot of the commandments, sure, we all sin, we all for, fall short, but uh, in the end, as long as my good deeds uh, outweigh my bad deeds, and today the virtuous things we talked about, like, you know, as long as I recycle and uh, drive an electric car, and as long as I'm trying to save the environment and uh, rescue animals, and, uh, and I promote the right agendas, and I'm on board with the, the current trends, and, and, I, and I virtue signal and, and all of that, that in the end, that makes me a good person. And, and because I'm a good person, in the end, I'll be in heaven. And so I don't need Christianity and I don't need Christ. And uh, that makes it very difficult to persuade people of their need for Christ in the gospel, this self-righteousness that people have. And so this has to be an emphasis in our preaching that none of us is good enough to go to heaven that our good works can't save us, that we need the work of Christ on the cross to save us. So I, I know I said that at the end of class hurriedly, but I wanted to emphasize it again back to back here as we go into the rest of this speech, because now he gives a warning. We saw already he has been citing, Paul has cited several passages, including Psalm 2, and also from Isaiah, whom Paul cites frequently, and then again, David in Psalm 16. Now he cites from the, later from the prophets, Habakkuk. And what's the warning that he gives in verse 40? For those of you who might be new to the class, I use the lavender 
highlighter, the, the, that light purple, to show a citation from the scripture. So, uh, beware, he says then, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Now, this text from Habakkuk, he says, look, you scoffers, and be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work. This is the Lord speaking of judgment coming on Israel. I'm doing a work in your days, a work that will not, you will not believe even if one tells it to you. Now, what he's dealing with here is this is in a series of, of questions and responses where Habakkuk is, he is quite disturbed by, he's upset by the fact that God is going to bring Babylon upon Israel, a pagan nation to come and take Israel away into captivity. And to Habakkuk, he's questioning the goodness of God. He's questioning the sovereignty. He's, he, he cannot reconcile this with the way he's thinking about God because he doesn't understand how God, the, our God, the God of Israel, could take a pagan nation, a people that, that um, does, a, a nation that does not know Yahweh and bring them to prevail over his own people. And so it was unthinkable, even, to those, even those to whom Habakkuk was preaching, to, as he was trying to warn the people and as he was wrestling with this himself. And so this is a pronouncement of judgment. God is going to bring judgment on Israel. And, he, and it's so incredible to them. It's so unbelievable to them that even if God tells it to them, they still cannot accept it. It's just too much. They cannot bring themselves to believe that this will happen. And so he's saying, now what God said to Israel, what God said through Habakkuk to the, to the people with judgment coming from Babylon, he's saying that same thing can happen if you reject the gospel. He's saying that same thing can come upon you. You will think this can't be true, that I need this, that this Jesus, this obscure person uh, that you're telling us was humiliated and crucified in Jerusalem, that this was all God's plan and that I need to believe in him and submit to him to be saved. It's too much for the Jew to believe as he's listening to Paul in the synagogue or uh, that was at least the, the main response. Some did believe. But uh, it just was incredulous to them that this could be true. And he's saying, ah, yes, you know what? That's what Israel thought when Habakkuk, when God was warning because of their idolatry that Babylon was going to come and conquer them and overthrow them. So they had a false sense of security. And so the same warning is, is here. Do you have a thought on that? This warning of the idea of something happening that you just can't bear to think could ever happen, and so you just refuse to believe it, even though God said it's going to happen, right? It's a powerful warning, but let's notice then, I, I pointed out that this is, I think, one of, the, one of the, the greater passages in the book of Acts that I don't hear a lot of teaching and preaching on, it, it doesn't seem to get as much attention as many other texts in the book of Acts, and yet I think it's so powerful, the reaction to it, and then what that Paul and Barnabas do, and what Paul says in response to the reaction. This is tremendous passage here. Notice verse 42. So as they went out, the people begged, and this is the word para, uh, uh, parakaleo. You remember I pointed this out in, in the Romans class, where Paul uses that to, instead of saying, I command you, I require you, he will, as sort of a polite rhetoric, as a way of being diplomatic, he'll say, I plead with you. But it is something he's telling them to do, but he's doing it in a nice way for, for effect, right? We learn to, that if you're in authority and you have the right to compel people to do things, though, aren't they, don't they tend to be more responsive if you're if you use you know, more delicate language than to just bark an order at someone. <laughs> so Paul would say, I beseech you, the older English translations, or I plead with you, or I beg you. But it's the word for the Holy Spirit uh, that, Luke, that John uses. He's the paraclete. Only, John, only in John do we find the Holy Spirit referred to that way. As, 
as one who uh, is, represents God's comforting, or he's God's comforting presence that suggests to us uh, something of the nature of the Holy Spirit. It's, that same, it's from that same root word. But what I want you to notice here, just for the Greek uh, nerds, if you care, if you're interested, but, but it is helpful, uh, is that it's in the imperfect. And all that means is it, it has the force of, of ongoing action to talk about something that has already occurred but is continuing to occur. And so, it, in other words, it means they kept on. They kept on, and that's the New American Standard Bible. Any of you use the New American Standard Bible? Uh, that translation is well known for and appreciated for its emphasis. A lot of translations will have different things that, they, that the translators pay special attention to that they really want to uh, make it a point that in, in, our, in this translation we're making, we're really going to pay attention to gender, or we're really going to pay attention to, uh, to, to the verbs. That's what the New American Standard Version does. It, it tries to render the force of these verbs uh, more vividly and more literally than a lot of translations do. And so the New American Standard Bible has it, they kept on begging them. So here's an audience wouldn't you love to preach and teach to people that say, I want to hear more, I want to hear more, that keep pestering you to tell them more? So this is a beautiful reaction to it. And so I love this. Uh, they say, come back to tell us these things again when the, when the people meet again in the synagogue the next Sabbath, that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. So after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts, okay, devout Converts. Now, back earlier in class, way back, this is in class 34, if anyone watching wants to reference the, the file that I uploaded with this. But we see in Acts where that word devout is sometimes used to describe e either Jews or Gentiles, meaning uh, pious, devoted to God, uh, sincerely convicted, that, that, that sort of idea. And notice... So you have these categories of Gentiles. You have the pagans, general unbelievers. Coming up in Acts 14, we'll see how Paul preaches to them. And it's much different than what he does in the synagogue with the Jews. Um, but then you have proselytes, those who could, you could actually be circumcised and join yourself to, a Gentile could join himself to the Jewish community and uh, bring himself fully under the law of Moses and so uh, those, were, those were proselytes, but those who would be in the synagogue who may not be full proselytes, but believe like Cornelius was a devout man who believed in the one true God, and he knew that was the God of these people, of these Israelites, of these Jews. And so those, you remember I keep using that word, uh, are, we refer to as, these as God-fearers. So a couple of times in this speech, Paul said, listen to me, my brothers, meaning the Jews, and you who fear God, right? So these God-fearers, or um, you'll have reference to Gentiles who were worshipers of, of God. So this is different than when you get in chapter 14, he's preaching to pagans. So what does he tell them to do here? That's back in, in class 34. The text says uh, these devout converts to Judaism, so these seem to be a way of referring to proselytes, they followed Paul and Barnabas who, as they spoke with them, urged them, oh, look at the theology in these little statements here, to continue in the grace of God. So they're seeking God and they're showing an interest and he's nurturing that, he's encouraging that. That's what we need to do with people. But notice the idea that uh, we're saved by the grace of God. But you have to continue in it, right? You can fall from it. Look at the language the Bible uses about grace. Paul says you stand in it, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and uh, at Romans 5, uh, he'll speak in those terms. You stand in the grace of God, but you have to remain in it. You can remove yourself from, from it, right? Just like the love of God, Jude would say, Keep yourselves in the love of God. And so in other words, it's not just, well, God, we're saved by grace and God loves me. And so that guarantees no matter how I live, no matter what I do, I'll be in heaven in the end. 
uh, well, I have to abide in that love. I have to respond to that love and continue to, and I have to continue in His grace. And several times Luke uses that language of remaining, abiding, uh, continuing in, as the ESV renders it here. Um, and notice he says, uh, in the grace of God. That's what I've added here now, uh, just brought in. In the grace of Continue in the grace. Now, Luke doesn't often mention the grace of God like Paul frequently does in his letters, but later, for example, Acts 20, 24, he says, I don't, I don't hold my life as dear to myself, but that I may finish my course to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So the good news that brings us the truth about God's saving grace. I commend you to God, verse 32, Acts 20, 32, I commend you to God and the word of his grace. In Acts 15, 11, they'll conclude when they're talking about whether the Gentiles had to keep the law of Moses. We're saved by the grace of God. So you do find those references in, in Acts. But um, that idea of continuing in God's grace is, a, is an important, it, it gives us insight into the, the favor of God, the grace of God, just that that language is used. But what happens then? So the next Sabbath, almost the whole city. So maybe he's being hyperbolic here. The whole city comes out. So now this is a big deal. This is drawing a lot of attention here. And uh, this is going to provoke the, the Jews to jealousy, right? So I, I, I'm a I was trying to think of a parallel situation for us so, as if... Maybe some, some uh, well-known preacher in the Church of Christ came to, to the area and, and started a church down the road, and everybody quit coming here and started going to the church down the road. Maybe people feel threatened by that or something. It's not, never mind, that's a terrible parallel. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of something where, where you, you're seeing, wait a minute, this guy's coming in, and he's teaching something that the rabbis, this isn't what we teach, this isn't what we believe, and all these people are interested in it and are going out to hear it. And, and so the, the, the whole city, now it's having an impact in the community and to hear the word of the Lord. Yeah, yeah. He's doing it in their building. And they, well, it the starts in their synagogue. Concept. Yeah, he's coming into our synagogue and preaching something now we don't believe, and now the whole town wants to show up at the synagogue and hear it. And you'd be like, hey, hey, wait, 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 wait. This isn't what we Jews actually teach and believe. You can see. And to hear the word of the Lord. He calls it the word of the Lord. So, and often he's using Lord there to mean Christ. So what, what's the response? Well, so when the Jews, when the Jews. So I know a lot of people think that you have this anti-Semitic attitude, like with that that kind of pejorative reference where you say the Jews as though you're condemning all the Jews, that this was the Jews who did this. So some translations will have a footnote or you might have the Jewish leaders or the unbelieving Jews because some, some of the Jews believe. But often, just like John does in his gospel, when he talks about the, the, the Jewish leaders confronting Jesus, he'll, he'll speak of the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. And uh, here, I think that that is the idea, is the un unbelievers who are hostile to the message, not that the whole community right down to the last person. Uh, well, what happens? They, they were filled with jealousy, with jealousy. So now it isn't about, uh, well, is this message true? Let's evaluate it. Let's search these scriptures that Paul is citing here. Let's look at the evidence for it. Now it's more about losing power, losing position. It's more about, uh, you know, political, feeling a political threat uh, than it is truly being, seeking God and wanting to be convicted by the truth. So that hoi, uh, hu, uh, hu daioi, the Jews there, the, the Jewish leaders, I meant to bring that in. But here with the jealousy, I know it's hard to see, but um, it's in the file. I'm just wanting to get it in there. That, um, you, you remember, um, Pilate perceived, remember Pilate didn't think Jesus was guilty of anything. And Mark tells us in Mark 15, 10, he perceived it was for jealousy. It was out of envy they delivered him up because he was so popular among the people. And that threatened their position over the people. And Pilate, even Pilate could see that, that jealousy. And in, in Romans 10, Paul talks about 
how uh, he hoped that um, that the when the Gen the Jews reject the gospel and the Gentiles come in and the Gentiles receive the blessings that God promised first to Israel, that this would provoke them to jealousy and that they would turn and believe the gospel. So it's interesting that idea of them being jealous. But what did they do then when they were jealous of the message? They began to contradict it. That's from the Greek word anti-lego. Lego is I say or I speak. Anti-lego. They began to speak against. That's what it means. Your, your Bible might have that. It might say speak against. To contradict what was spoken by Paul. And then do you have this? Reviling him. You see that? Yes, it's the word blasphemeo. It's the word for blaspheme, to speak against. Um, and with the idea of not just speaking against something, but speaking against God, right? Now, this is one of the more, this passage I find quite disturbing when I think about what Paul was doing when he was persecuting Christians. But later in, in Acts 26, 11, when he's before Agrippa, he tells Agrippa how, and it, it makes his whole story about his conversion more convincing because he said, I was persecuting these believers. And he said, and I strove to make them blaspheme. So Paul was arresting people and interrogating. That's frightening to me. It makes me think of the Gestapo. It makes me think of communist uh, uh, tyrannical regimes when you hold beliefs that are not uh, permitted. And how do they get you to contradict those beliefs? They, they torture you, right? They, they arrest you, they threaten you, they, they torture you, they intimidate you. Paul said, I was trying to get them to blaspheme. Now he realizes um, in trying to get them to renounce Christ, he was actually trying to make them blaspheme God. What a horror that must have been to him to think that now the Lord he loves and that he's giving his life for, he was trying to get people to blaspheme the Lord. He, in 1 Timothy 1.20, he said, I delivered Hymenaeus and Alexander to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. It's that same word. Now notice they're blaspheming. So by, by opposing the gospel, you are speaking against God. You are opposing God. When you oppose the message, when you oppose the church upholding that message, in a sense, you are blaspheming your God, the God. That, that should be considered a uh, blasphemy in that, in that sense. And contrast that with the attitude in a minute we'll see where they show honor to the word of the Lord. All right, let's, let's continue on here so I can get through this, this chapter. And so Paul and Barnabas, notice, they're contradicting Paul. They're blaspheming the message. They're going to be stirring up persecution. So what does Paul do? Does Paul and Barnabas say, okay, look, we've got to find a more, we, we need to soften the message here because it's controversial now and people are objecting to it. And uh, now we, we want to make sure, we're not going to get as many likes on Instagram. You know, we're not going to get as many thumbs up on our social media posts if we keep pressing this issue. Um, this is what you see over and over in Acts, is in the face of hatred and hostility and, um, and contempt, in the face of all opposition, they are bold. That's something you see over and over again as they speak out all the more boldly and uh, numerous references. I want you to see that as you go through Luke, that the church is going to be hated that what we believe is not going to be popular. We're seeing that in our own culture now as uh, just believing that marriage is between a man and a woman, uh, believing that there are only two genders. Y you can be reviled as hateful uh, for, for b believing things that everyone in all the history of the world believed up until 20 minutes ago, as I, as I often say. You hear me say that over and over. Um, and so what a lot of people who claim to be Christians are doing is they, they, they don't like that stigma, and, uh, and so they, they want the approval of the world more than the approval of God. They care more about pleasing the culture than Christ, and they're capitulating, they're softening, they're, they're compromising. And instead, what we need to do is be all the more bold in confronting the insanity and the ignorance and the blasphemy 
of our culture. It's not a time to be intimidated and back down. We can be loving and we should be kind and respectful, but we need to be firm and uncompromising. And that's what we see over and over in, in the apostolic preaching in the early church in Acts. And I think these disciples would be ashamed if they saw how cowardly, how afraid Christians are to offend people in their families or in their communities or in their social circles be, uh, be, because they, they worried more about someone not liking them than uh, hearing the truth. So they spoke out boldly. There's my little sermon for you, okay? So it was necessary, Paul says, that the word of God, that the word of God be spoken first to you, right? It's to the Jew first uh, and also to the Greek, Romans 1.16. This is Paul. Paul's the, the apostle to the Gentiles. He's taking the gospel out to the Gentile world, but he goes to the Jews first. Their Messiah, the Messiah God sends to the world comes through Israel, and it's offered to them first. And it's, so it's to the Jew first. But he says, so it's necessary we start with you. It's, your, it, it's Israel's Messiah, but he's Messiah for the rest of the world. And if you're not going to receive it, we're going to turn to the Gentiles. So since you, look at this. This will be very important in a minute here. You thrust it aside. You thrust it aside or reject it. Since you are taking what God is offering to you and you're just taking it and throwing it away. You're thrusting it aside. Very powerful language. And this is absolutely staggering to me to contemplate that this. And when, when, when we reject the gospel or when we refuse to conform ourselves to it, we might say we believe it, but if we're not living according to it, really, in a sense, we're turning down eternal life. But notice how he says it. You're judging yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Not that we could ever be worthy in the sense of earning eternal life, earning salvation. But what he's saying is you're turning down everlasting life. It, in essence, you're saying, I don't want to live forever. I want to suffer eternal death. I don't care. It's like you're making a judgment about yourself that you're considering yourself unworthy of what God is trying to give you. It's, uh, it's staggering to think that that's what we're doing when we reject the gospel. We're saying, I don't want eternal life. Uh, and and it, it's as though you're making this judgment of, on yourself. And he says, notice that he says it's eternal life. And very rare, rarely do we see that in Acts. Just here and then again in verse 48. And just in this context, although he'll speak of the, the, this life, sometimes just life, just a couple of times in Acts 5.20 and 11.28. But, but eternal life, who's the one that speaks? Think of some key passages in the Bible. Who speaks the most of Salvation as eternal life, eternal life. Think of the golden text of the Bible, Joanna. Mm -hmm. You don't think you're worthy. You don't, it's not like you, it's, everyone wants. That's you. true, right, right. That's why I think it's a figure of a speech. You're right. It's not that they're saying I don't, right, right. I'm saying, though, that's what it amounts to. That's what it, that it's, Paul is saying it's like it, it's as though you're saying, I don't want eternal life. Now, it's true. Everyone wants to live forever, right? No one literally wants to die. No one literally wants to go to hell, right? Who, who wants to go to hell? No one wants to. Everyone wants to, to live forever in glory and blessedness, in peace and in joy. But, but. Turning down the gospel is such a, an egregious sin, even against yourself. It's like you're saying, I'm not, I'm not worthy of that. I don't even want that. I don't even care about that. Now, that. That's where I'm saying, I think, is the implication of it. But literally, yes, he's saying they're, they're thinking of themselves as not being worthy of it. But I, I don't think that means that Paul is saying, well, you have such a low estimate of yourself. You have such a humble view of yourself that, that this message doesn't appeal to you because you just don't think you deserve so great a blessing. No, I think he's telling him how foolish they're being. And so it's not literal, but it's a, it's a figure of speech. But that's good that you're noticing the language. Yeah. Well, it, who says eternal life the most, 
right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have salvation, will have eternal life, right? Eternal life. John is the one who uses that language. In John's gospel, it's over and over and over. Rare for Luke to say that in Luke's gospel. And in here, Luke part two, which is the book of Acts, right? A continuation of that. So, whoops, I, f I forgot my fun little uh, explanation uh, marks here that are off on my palate. Uh, but, but how is Luke speaking of salvation in terms of eternal life? He's emphasizing the preaching of the resurrection. So really, he does say a lot about eternal life, doesn't use that language, but he's showing we're preaching a message that even though we die in Christ, we're going to be raised. He was raised from the dead, and we're going to be raised from the dead, and if we're faithful to him, we'll be raised never to die again, to live forever. So the resurrection is e eternal life. So that could be where we see that, uh, th that emphasis of salvation in the apostolic preaching in the gospel. Notice, notice that he says, too, now, as he quotes from verse 47, he says, uh, since you judge yourselves un unworthy of eternal life, you see the, the point right here? So we're going to turn to the Gentiles, all right? Then we're going to turn to the Gentiles because the Lord commanded us to do that. So the Lord has commanded us. Where did the Lord command this? He cites Isaiah 49, where in that passage, the prophet, he's talking about Israel. God is speaking through Isaiah and says about the nation of Israel. I've made you. It's a very important concept about what Israel was supposed to be. I've made you a light for the Gentiles. See, that language then would be used of Christ. They were to be a light of the knowledge of the one true God, of the morality of God that through, through the law of Moses that in Deuteronomy, Moses says this, this makes you an example, essentially he tells them uh, of the world. This is your wisdom before the world. It reveals the wisdom of God. They were supposed to preserve the knowledge and the wisdom of God and so be a light in the world. But so many times they compromised and ad adopted the paganism of their neighbors. So they failed in this. But then Christ comes, the true son uh, that Israel failed to be as the light to, to the world. But he tells Israel, I've made you a light to, to the Gentiles. Why? He says, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So Paul said, this is the way, Israel, this is the way we are a light to the whole world, to the ends of the earth, by bringing the message of our Messiah, Jesus by bringing the gospel to the whole world. So Paul's saying, you know what? That's a, command. That's a command of God to preach the gospel to the world. So think of Israel was to be a light to the world, to bring Christ into the world, and Christ is the light to the Gentiles. That language is used in, in Luke part one, back in Luke's gospel, that um, in the Nunc uh, Demetrius, that... Um, that Jesus would be a light to the, to the Gentiles. And then we now, as the church, just like Paul looks at that as now, we're to take that message to the world. God, the Lord's commanded that to bring that message of salvation. And so uh, we're, we're to be the Israel of God. We're to be the light to the world, a light to the nations, to take the light. We should view that as a responsibility that we have to take this message to the nations, as it were. All right, let me see if I can get to this. This is really good. I'm, I know I'm rushing through this, but watch. So when the Gentiles heard this, unlike the others who... Now, here are the Jews to whom the message comes. Paul cites their own scriptures to them. And if you weren't here last week, earlier in the chapter, I think it's, it's verse 27, right, where he says, because you, you, when they crucified Jesus, because they did not know the voice of their own prophets that were read to them every Sabbath day. They were hearing the word of God every Sabbath day, but they didn't listen. They didn't heed. They didn't understand it. And so they fulfilled it. So here Paul's quoting their own prophets to them. He's quoting their own scriptures to them and they're contradicting it. They're blaspheming. They're opposing it. But the Gentiles, by contrast, they're rejoicing and they're glorifying the word of the Lord. So the, so the unbelieving Jews are blaspheming God by speaking against his word. 
whereas they are glorious. It's from dogzadso, from the word dogza for glory. It means they're honoring the word of the Lord. When you hear and heed scripture, you are honoring God's word. And you are thereby glorifying the God of that word. You are glorifying and honoring God that way. Paul uses that language in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 as well. Now, this is a tricky theological statement right here. I want to spend a couple minutes on it. So, Luke's telling us about the reaction. The Gentiles heard. They rejoiced. They began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life, believe. Okay. All right. Have you been appointed to eternal life? So I want you to think about that. This is a, a, a big verse used to support uh, the Calvinistic view that you don't choose God, God chooses you. And unless God has chosen you to salvation, you cannot believe. And so those who do believe are believing because God appointed those people to be saved. He appointed them. God determined before the world began who would be saved and who would be lost. It has nothing to do with your will, your choice. It's all God's choosing. And double predestination is not only did he predestine that some would be saved and, and he would cause them to believe the gospel and they cannot possibly be lost and they will have eternal life, but he predestined those who would reject the gospel who would be lost and be under eternal damnation. So if you've been appointed by God, then you will believe. So this is taken, this is a quote, and I think this might be a quote from Calvin himself. It's from a... A, a Calvinist writer. And there are some Calvinist theologians that are more Calvinistic than Calvin was, it seems. But um, this is taken as absolute proof of, of predestination. This, this idea that God appoints who's going to be saved, who, who's going to be lost. And if you're one of the people God has appointed to be saved, then when you hear the gospel, you believe. That's why some people believe and some people don't. All right, that's Calvinism. So let's go over the Calvinistic picture, right? It's often uh, framed in terms of this acrostic, the word tulip, right? We're going to tiptoe through the tulip here, right? What's the T? By the way, Calvinism is uh, enjoying a resurgence. Ref there's a resurgence of Reformed theology in our day, and I think part of it is people are so sick, some people are so sick of the watered-down substantive, uh, substantive list, is that a word? Uh, uh, preaching that's not substantive. Help me with that, Richard. Um, people are tired of like the Joel Alstein therapeutic self-help type preaching and churches that don't really have any content, any doctrinal, any robust, systematic doctrinal content to their, to their beliefs. And so a lot of people are turning to Calvinism because it is a rigid doctrinal system. And so it is something we need to contend with and be aware that more and more people are persuaded by this theology of Scripture, a way of viewing Scripture. And it starts with, the T is what? Total depravity, that we all inherit the guilt of Adam's sin, we inherit a corrupt nature and we cannot help but sin, and we're so depraved, it's total depravity, that we cannot possibly respond of ourselves to the gospel. So God unconditionally elects some people to be saved. Unconditional means you don't choose it, it's not your will, there's no conditions you meet, whereby God says, okay, because you did this, therefore you will be saved. It's unconditional and it's God who elects you. God chooses you. Jesus, the limited atonement is Jesus then just dies for the elect, not for everyone. And then if you're elected, the, the I, the irresistible grace is, if you've been elected to salvation, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and cause you to believe, and it's impossible to resist it. If God selected you, you will believe, and you cannot possibly not believe. So uh, it's, His grace is irresistible. And if you're one of the elect, um, for whom Jesus died, and God sends the Holy Spirit upon you and causes you to believe, you cannot possibly lose your salvation. The impossibility of apostasy or perseverance of the saints. Well, this is one of those verses used to talk about, see, God predestined who would be saved, because here Luke says the ones that he appointed to 
eternal life were the ones who believed. So if you weren't appointed by God to have eternal life, predestined, determined by God to have eternal life, then, then you don't believe and, and you're going to be lost. All right, well, let's think about that for a minute. And you see this language, for example, look in Romans 8, right? This idea of predestination. We got a couple minutes. Let me see if I can get this in. So Paul talks about, look at verse 29. Those whom he foreknew, there's the word, he predestined, all right? to be conformed to the image of his son, those he predestined, he called. So if you're one of the predestined, then he'll send the gospel to you and you'll respond to that call and you'll be justified and in the end you'll, you'll be glorified, right? Okay, so uh, in Romans 9 then, remember Paul said when he's talking, I addressed this at length in Romans. Look at verse 15. I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. Because you, you might think, well, isn't that unjust? Isn't it unjust if God chooses some people to be saved and, and other people he doesn't choose to be saved? You say, well, who are you to question God? So verse 15, he says, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. So it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So the Calvinist says, see, see, it doesn't depend on you and your will. It's God's will who determines who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. So whether you have eternal life or not isn't your determination. It's determined by God, and they appeal to this to support that, that God will choose to save whomever he wills, and who are you to question God? And then he says here, uh, again, the idea that before, before the foundation of the world, he chose us. So he chose those who would be saved before he predestined us. That language you find it used a number of times. Let me pull that out here in Romans, uh, Ephesians, also in Peter. But, but remember this. See, the error here, yes, the Bible teaches God predestines us for salvation. God does, in a sense, determine whether you'll be saved or be lost. But it doesn't mean your will is not involved. Because God can foreknow how you will respond to the gospel, his foreknowledge. He knew before I was ever born that I would believe the gospel. And so God determined that all who believe the gospel will have eternal life. So before I was even born, God determined I'd have eternal life because he determined those who believe will be saved, and I'm one of those who believed. So in that sense, it doesn't remove your will because remember, if it has nothing to do with your will, why the warning that he just gave? What did he just say in verse 46? What did he just say? You thrust the word of God away from you. That, that implies they were doing that. They were responsible for that. Not that, well, God chose you to reject his word so you couldn't believe it even if you wanted to. It's impossible for you to, to believe it. He's saying they were choosing to throw it aside. That implies responsibility. And you see that over and over again. Uh, we'll see passages and acts that seem to imply God is totally sovereign in salvation where it's all his determining, but then you'll see other verses that balance that with that we have free will. Give me one verse since the, the final bell rang. Give me a verse in the Bible that teaches you have free will that you can choose. John 1.12. But all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right, the right to become. To yeah, to all who receive him. The problem is, is the Calvinist will say, okay, to all who received him, but other verses show the only ones who can receive him are those whom he chooses and determines ahead of time. So, so that alone, I don't think, is convincing. Although, when you take the whole biblical picture, certainly that's showing you that we, we have to choose. Well, well, I'm saying, though, that verse of itself does not prove you have free will because it still could be... Save yourself, so you have a responsibility. Um, and I suppose what I just said about that verse, they might say about these other passages as well, Bo. But um, here, so you can see that a little better. Let me just finish with that here. Just think about those passages. Think about how would you show someone that the Bible does indeed teach. Can I blow that up? No. That the Bible does indeed teach you have free will. Remember Joshua said, choose you this day, right? But... One of my favorite to use is in John, J Jesus says to the Jews, he doesn't say you cannot come to me that you might have eternal life. There's John talking about salvation as eternal life. He says, you will not. 
you will not come to me, John 5.40, that you might have eternal life. John 7.17 7, we could add as well. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 23.37, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that stones the prophets and kills those who are sent to you. How often I wanted to gather you together as the hen gathers her chickens under her wings. And you were not willing. God wants to save everyone. And God will save everyone who believes. That's what he appointed. That's what he determined but our choice is still whether we will accept and believe and respond or reject. So uh, think about that. It's very important because that verse is a key verse in that whole controversy. And I'll give you some other examples in Acts where you see both sides. You see both divine sovereignty that God is, is the one giving salvation, granting salvation. But you'll see human agency and how that all comes together. That yes, God is ultimately in control, guiding the course of all things. But he is respecting our free will. So, John, we're, so we're done. Christ, yeah. In him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, he destined us in love. And so, when in Christ we are the predestined, in any other way, there's no, we, we can only be predestined through Christ. In him, we have. In Christ. Ephesians 1, right? That, that great text in Ephesians 1. Um, right, right. So, think about those things that. Um, are you one of those who God has appointed to have eternal life? Well, I think the fact that you're here, if you're faithful to Christ right now, that shows that you, you are because you've chosen to be. And God has chosen to save those who choose Him. Thanks. I'm just going to keep talking if you don't leave. So. But yeah, I wish I could get a shot of the whole class here. There's so many people here. Thanks, John. Almost every seat full today. <laughs>